जय हिंद दोस्तों मैं हूं मेजर मोहम्मद अली शाह और आप में से कई लोगों ने मेरे मोटिवेशनल टॉक्स देखे होंगे मेरे यूट्यूब चैनल पे हैं अगर नहीं देखे होंगे तो आप अभी यहां पे सब्सक्राइब कर सकते हैं खैर मैं आपसे टाइम टू टाइम गुफ्तु करता रहता हूं और आपको मनोबल बनाने के लिए आता रहता हूं मैं और आज मैं लेके आया हूं एक बहुत ही बेहद खास मेहमान इट्स माई ऑनर एंड प्रिवलेज दैट ही हैज अग्रीड and given us a time to come on the show us and speak to you all to make sure that you people are pepped up in these trying times or difficult times well if you see them as trying or difficult time they would be trying and difficult so we have none other than dr fawad halim saab who needs no introduction you all know him but for those who don't know let me tell you all a small a few things dr fawad halim saab is a tedx speaker he is a politician he is a renowned doctor in calcutta who himself had covid asthma seven times he conducts dialysis in just 50 rupees would you believe that in calcutta and much more to his credit but let let us now move on and speak to dr fawad alim sir thank you very much for agreeing to be with us sir adab namaste and thank you ali and your entire team for having me on this conversation it's a privilege and definitely it's an opportunity that i would not have missed i <laughs> kind of you are always gracious as ever fawad bhai dosto main bahut hi garv se thoda bolta hu ki dr fawad alim sahab incidentally also let me show off a bit happens to be my brother in law So, okay, anyhow, so for the people know about you professionally, but people may not be knowing about your childhood. Tell us how was it growing up as an Aikin's son, as Mr. Hashim Abdul Hali, who was the speaker of the West Bengal Assembly. For, he holds a place in the Limca Book of Records. How was it growing up in the shadows of him, and how you grew out of those shadows first? well there are two parts of that uh, what we call uh, growing up the first part is uh, up to 7 years when uh, uh, papa had to be underground and he had to <laughs> due to the extreme oppression of the ruling party at that time he could not return home and we, we didn't know uh, what whether, whether he would come back home or not but i was very young at that time and up to uh, the age of 7 that was the scenario and uh, after the first left front government came to power in 77 then <laughs> the sense of uh, having somebody who is uh, very very active in politics is what we uh, attached to our political environment of growing up and uh, those seven years and uh, my elder siblings the sobriety of those previous years is something that has helped us for people pull through the years that uh, papa was in power and uh, he was a law minister in the first term of left front government and he was a speaker uh, subsequently for 29 years uh, which you mentioned is in the limca book of records and it's a global records of sorts and uh, the sobriety of those years pri- prior to coming to power is something that has helped us what you call balance our attitude to how uh, somebody in a powerful position of government is a member of your family and that has uh, stood us in good stead that is uh, uh, and papa himself was ensured we never had security at our house we've been to our home a number of times ali and you must have noticed there was never a, a policeman guarding the house there was no, never a security at our door and the trappings of power has ne- something that never ever touched us and uh, i think so our father ensured that the very very meticulously that the trappings of power would not be part of our household life and uh, we never used our official privileges anyway and we conducted ourselves as normal citizens and uh, we've been part of civil society without the trappings of power and uh, that uh, overbearing what you call relationship that you allude to in your question is something that has never been of great concern for us so we've always stood in lines for uh, booking our tickets in fact it was a surprises to saira that uh, when i visited her i always visited her as a normal what you call train traveler without without any special what you call uh, 
privilege is i remember once i was coming back and my ticket was unreserved and she was a bit surprised at that time how could somebody who is the son of the speaker is is traveling in an unreserved coach because his reservation has not been confirmed and he cannot manage it that's the way we were brought up at and i think so that has helped us uh, uh, with our life while uh, we had a, a father who was in in a position of privilege in government and subsequently after the government went in uh, 2011 it didn't impact us severely so it it's helped us uh, grow up and uh, i think so those attitudes are fundamental and uh, the influence of having a great in your family has a, a something that we have respected at the same time it has also uh, by the approach that the entire family took towards it tempered our uh, attitude to handle such what we call over balance and we grew independently as children of somebody who, who, who was a very prominent person that's such a fine quality to emulate for bhai dosto suna aapne insaan kis khandan mein paida hota hai ye zaruri nahi hai insaan kis parivar mein paida hota hai ye zaruri nahi hai insaan khud hai wo bahut zaruri hai ancestry is something which is not to be boasted about it's something to live up to which dr fawad halim is carrying the baton forward and he's doing it so well father bhai also tell us one thing what and who inspired you to become a doctor a very noble profession my mother always always wanted me to become a doctor and i'm not a doctor khair ban nahi paya but my brother in law is a doctor and i'm very proud of you one doctor should always be in the family so she got a daughter married to a doctor wo alag baat hai so become a doctor father from very young age uh, since i what you call uh, remember Uh, myself as as uh, having memories uh, of of uh, myself my family and my surroundings i remember that i always wanted to become a doctor so there was no other profession that i aspired for uh, since my childhood since i what you call uh, started having uh, my senses around me and my bits around me and i think so that was <laughs> pivotal in my understanding towards my uh, profes- profession because i i never looked at any plan b since i was young so all the memories that uh, i have uh, or, uh, as a child and growing up as as a young adult was uh, directed towards becoming a, a part of the medical profession and as somebody who would go out and set forth in society an element of uh, healing and uh, that uh, entire desire of trying to heal people of their uh, ill from their illnesses is something that had motivated me from a very young age and uh, uh, my entire family has uh, helped me uh, they've guided me to actually reach and achieve that goal and uh, subsequent to my passing my uh, medical degree i have uh, been associated with the medical profession more in terms of uh, as a healer in trying to help people get over their illnesses Uh, and not merely somebody who looks at uh, a patient from the point of view that he has disease and you remove the disease it's more a question of healing somebody and that uh, attitude has not only helped me become part of the medical profession but also have uh, bring my attitude to the medical profession too right was bhai and father you also do dialysis in on a very very affordable cost Just tell us a bit about that. How do you manage such a thing, which I don't think I don't know anyone else in not in the country but in the world. I don't know <laughs> who would be doing that. Perhaps you see, the, Ali, the dialysis is a suboptimal form of treatment. Suboptimal form of treatment uh, is defined by a treatment uh, procedure, whereby at the end of the procedure you do not achieve a, a healed patient. For example, if you do an appendectomy on a patient. after you remove the sutures and the healing period is over the patient is back to his old self you cured him of the malady if somebody has malaria for example you give them a course of anti malarial and at the end of the course the patient is healed his his problem is solved but dialysis is a suboptimal treatment in that after giving the dialysis you cannot heal the patient you cannot cure the patient the patient will require a subsequent session of dialysis Uh, especially for patients who are chronic renal failure patients 
and we do know that the disease burden of chronic renal failure patients is humongous in india and uh, it's a recurrent cost and the cost is what actually allows a poor patient from a lower middle class or a uh, below poverty line patient to actually continue with that many days of his or her life uh, scientifically we know if somebody is, is adequately dialyzed then that person can reach his or her normal life expectancy as if somebody is is uh, without this disease the only question is whether they can afford to go on with dialysis for 20 years 25 years you know that period has to be crossed and finance then becomes a very very big question so it was here that we uh, our group of uh, school friends basically this unit is run by a group uh, and we all went to school together and we had dispersed to our various what you call professions and lives and then we regrouped when we are crossed our <laughs> 40s and we said that we need to do something and we identified uh, dialysis as something that uh, we can uh, work upon and with our varied backgrounds we came together and brought various various expertise to on the table and we identified that if we can help somebody live his or her life for as long as possible by supporting dialysis then that is that is something that we have achieved in our lives and uh, we uh, achieved this on uh, by working on three core principles the first principle is that we are a no frills infrastructure that is we do not have anything additional to that which is required for dialysis for example we do not have air conditioning in our unit because air conditioning adds costs and that cost will cut out life expectancy from our patient's life so we have cut out air conditioning and most of our patients when they go back home they do not have air conditioning back at home so that's a simple example we have also cut out other frills for example uh, we give our patients two bed sheets at the beginning of the year and the patients wash these bed sheets and bring them and we spread them and do their dialysis and when they go back home they take the bed sheets back home and they wash it at home and bring it back the next time so over here what we are doing we are cutting out the washing and the uh, housekeeping costs from the dialysis so wherever wherever we have been able to what you call cut the <laughs> cost of dialysis uh, and uh, we make patients participate in the dialysis process uh, we we've been sure that a lot lot of the unnecessary costs that are factored in into the uh, process of dialysis is reduced we are a stand alone dialysis unit that means we we are not part of a large hospital you know a large hospital has a director they have a medical superintendent they've got other categories of hierarchy of staff and every patient that's admitted into the hospital including dialysis patient have to somewhere contribute to their salaries and costs to the company that these hierarchical structures what will require since we are a stand alone dialysis unit we do not have any administrative costs so in various ways the first principle we maintain is that we have cut out all extra costs from the system the second is that all our suppliers who uh, supply us with equipment and uh, uh, consumables they are somewhere connected with us at at at, at an organization level they are the members of the organization or they have had family who have faced dialysis and the problems of dialysis and hence they make uh, what you call materials available to us at something which is very very competitive in comparison to the market so we cut costs humongously of there on a consumables and uh, whatever uh, what you call machinery and equipment and amcs that we require for running our organization the third place is definitely our donors we've had our donors come in and when they understand that when they donate to this organization every rupee that they transfer to the organization is actually translated to relief to the patient as i mentioned earlier there is no administrative costs in our organization. so every rupee comes in and goes direct as a relief to the patient which is why we get cut down the costs of dialysis the donors are very very confident that whatever they uh, provide in terms of uh, donations goes directly to relieve the patients of their ch- of the challenges that they are facing in in doing their dialysis and stitching these three things together uh, we ensure that we can ensure dialysis at uh, 350 rupees during non covid times and during covid times when we understood there are serious challenges to transporting patients to the uh, hospital and back uh, home uh, we reduced it to 50 rupees we've done 6332 dialysis last year and this year during our lockdown we have crossed almost uh, 600 dialysis 
at rupees 50 nothing but respect for you fahad bhai nothing but respect you know a couple of days back i remember someone reached out to me on uh, facebook and i connected them to you and like this there are many other friends there's a personal friend of mine like shashank from catfit and then there are a lot of other friends who have always told me that you know can you put me through doctor fahad ali and you have been very approachable despite your busy schedule i know you are extremely busy and you have been extremely helpful be it at midnight you don't see the time you are always there for for your patient for you so you're doing great work for by so that's why that makes you even more different from the others and more the person connected established now i want to ask you couple of months back you yourself being a corona warrior you were fighting and trying to help people patients you were down with covid-19 you got corona people say if you take precautions you wear double mask and wash your hands and be careful there are people who say that and if you mean to say other people mean to say matlab jinhone ko corona precaution nahi liye the kya unne bhi liye honge dr fawad ali ne bhi liye the let's hear your experience about when you had corona and how you when you got diagnosed and your experience on that i know it wasn't pleasant but just would like to hear for others education to advise well there are two parts to parts to this uh, question that you have placed one is that uh, definitely covid precautions are very very important and uh, unfortunately despite taking all covid precautions we have lost close to about a total of, of close to about 2000 doctors and i'm just talking about doctors there are other categories of healthcare workers who have worked with covid patients who have lost their lives so just doctors close to about 2000 we have lost uh, lost over the past uh, year and a half since covid has uh, <coughs> landed on indian soil uh, globally the figures are, are far far uh, greater and humongous so frontline workers are always exposed to the opportunity of getting infected and uh, since we have to deal with covid patients and one has to understand that among the healthcare workers there are two categories uh, one category is uh, those people who chose uh, to withdraw from uh, delivering healthcare because uh, they they considered their personal safety to be of a uh, primary importance and there are the other category who actually were on the front line and were fighting covid uh, in from the trenches of the front line and uh, 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 my my salutations to those people uh, all over in in india those who have sacrificed their lives those who have fought from the front lines of covid and are still fighting from the front line of covid and uh, as, as somebody who was fighting covid right on the front line not a single day i closed my chamber not a single day i refused any patient and uh, during the entire process i continued with whatever precautions and safety measures as a, as a, j- a practitioner one was supposed to take and in spite of that there are number of uh, vagaries that are involved with uh, covid body call uh, infections uh, i got infected and uh, when i got infected uh, i i had a severe degree of uh, uh, disease and i had to go into the uh, icu my lungs were co- compromised and uh, my i i understood that this, this this disease has to be fought at various levels and the primary level that the disease has to be fought on is to understand what is going on and i understood what is going on in my lungs and what i need to do to counter the infection that's going on in my lungs and hence whatever was recommended and whatever i understood was important in those recommendations recommendations i followed meticulously and which is why uh, i could fight covid and uh, become victorious and come back and i joined work uh, the day i was uh, given sanction that my quarantine is over and uh, when i understood that plasma therapy which is an important way of countering covid needs a lot of research to be done and you start off this research by actually making plasma available and plasma for covid patients or covid research could only be made possible uh, if somebody who had been affected by covid and had adequate titers and was uh, free of other what you call uh, uh, contraindications for giving plasma if they can come forward and give plasma then the research regarding plasma therapy against covid would come to a conclusion and that motivated me which is why i donated plasma seven times and uh, it, it was a uh, uh, a very very important for uh, all covid uh, recovered patients who uh, came forward 
donated their pl- plasma uh, and the importance lies in the fact that without the, that plasma we could not have concluded the research uh, today plasma is not recommended uh, but the con- research uh, would not have been concluded had people not come forward and donated plasma at that point of time that's wonderful vaad bhai such a noble gesture on your part dosto suna aapne corona se baad mein theek hone ke baad sat bar plasma donate kiya apna lot of father alip sahab ne so very noble gesture vaad bhai i would like to i know you are running short of time and you have patience to attend i'll just ask you a quick question uh, just clarify my doubts you know Uh, year 2007, if I am not mistaken, uh, when uh, the Vice President of India, Mr. Hamid Ansari, was appointed the uh, Vice President of the Vice President of India, that time there were a lot of rumors floating around, especially in the local media, about your father, Mr. Hashim Abdul Halim, probably going as the Vice President. What was that story going on that time? Well, at that time, the <laughs> United Progressive Alliance had the uh, CPIM supporting the uh, Congress Party. and uh, the uh, post for the vice president had come up for the elections and my father mr hashim abdul halim was the speaker of the west bengal uh, legislative assembly he was also uh, the chairperson of the commonwealth parliamentary association he was also president of the world federation of united nations associations so uh, given his uh, repute and given at that time uh, the closeness with which the united progressive alliance was working Uh, the various names that had uh, that had come up for discussion for vice presidentship uh, included uh, some suggestions from certain quarters regarding his uh, what we call uh, uh, possibility the possibility of him becoming uh, the vice president or standing for election uh, when that uh, came to the fore it was very clear uh, that uh, the decision on uh, of my father and uh, the party that he belonged to was not uh, considering this as an option so despite the good wishes and the uh, good intentions of certain quarters in the political milieu uh, requesting uh, a, a situation or desiring a situation where he would be come vice president of india the situation did not political materialize or move in that direction so history was talking, written differently right for right. the talking about uh, your father's right. political career, career you stood for elections from baliganj this time you stood for election earlier from uh, from which constituency was that diamond harbor if i am mistaken i stood from baliganj as the vidhan sabha twice and i stood right. for uh, the lok sabha from diamond harbor yeah that's right, that's right. so for the where do you see your self as a doctor as a politician in future well ali uh, if you've known me very very closely and uh, if you've uh, understood what i do is that i don't live in two separate boxes i am a doctor for a certain period of time and i am a politician for a certain period of time it's not that it's uh, my my medical practice and my politics is something that is born out of the same ideological commitment so if i see patients uh, for uh, what you call uh, in, in a particular way if i treat them in a particular way i i ensure that the poorest of the poor have the opportunity to access my services and they have the opportunity for completing the medical treatment under me so that entire outlook is born out of the way i i chose my politics and uh, i i ensure that uh, my politics has a fun is fundamentally rooted in the idea that health should be a fundamental right and uh, health is, is is something that uh, at at an opportune moment should not challenge a family in such a way that will push them behind the uh, poverty line because we have catastrophic health expenditures as one of the leading causes for sending families uh, be below the poverty line and hence my politics and my practice both intermingle and arise from the same fountain head of commitment that i have towards my ideology and uh, i i live in one box so my practice and my politics flow seamlessly uh, one into the other and i live a single life i do not have Uh, different lives and uh, the way i see myself in the future is the way i saw myself when i entered medical school that i would be practicing for people who do not have access to the uh, structures of health that exist in society whether it be government whether it be private and make myself uh, available to those disadvantages disadvantaged people 
at the same time i would uh, see uh, myself as somebody who would be fighting for the rights of the uh, underprivileged in terms of health and the broader economic con- uh, construct also so proud of you was bhai and thank you so much for sparing your time for us wonderful being in conversation with you bhai dosto suna aapne dr paul halim sahab ka kya kehna tha उन्होंने हमारे लिए वक्त निकाला हमारे साथ करी अब आपका फर्ज बनता है आप इस टॉक को शेयर करें लोगों को बताइए लोगों तक पहुंचाइए क्योंकि कई लोगों को इल्म नहीं है इस बात के बारे में कि डायलिसिस पचास रुपए साढ़े तीन सौ रुपए में भी हो पाता है और हो रहा है अच्छा काम दुनिया में हो रहा है तो आप फैलाइए ये बात ताकि लोगों की कम अज कम जाने जो है वो बच पाए थैंक यू वेरी मच फवाद भाई थैंक्स लॉट थैंक यू फॉर है